what's going on? And welcome back to episode six of Catching Carbon. I am Luke Lana. This is my co-host, Jeff Holyoke. If this is your first time joining in, we are all about the supply of CO2. We work in the CO2 industry and there have been a lot of changes as of late. We've opened up this platform to start having conversations and make you aware. Uh, some of the key pillars of this podcast is, is one, ensuring that we're not interrupting your business because you cannot get CO2. So how do we secure that supply for you? And number two, our key phrase is you have to be in the black before you're in the green. It has to make financial sense for you to take on some of these green initiatives. I've got my uh, protect our land shirt on today. I love it. But exactly what we want to talk about is how do we do this profitably and make sure that uh, we truly are in the black while focusing on being in the green. So today we have an exciting topic. We're going to be talking about CO2 and water treatment. Do you like it? Oh, I, can you not tell, man? How granola is this? Exactly. You didn't answer the question. Do you hike? I do. You're a rucksacker? I do. Right on. Anyway, last time, uh, last episode, we scared the hell out of you a little bit about beer, that there's going to be no more beer. Now we're going to scare you that there's going to be no more water. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we can joke about it, but we're seeing it in the news. Everything that we talk about on this podcast has been a national headline. Right now, down in Jackson, Mississippi, there's concerns with water. And our, our listeners probably don't even know that CO2 plays a critical role in drinking water. Absolutely. So what, what's probably the, the least understood use, use of CO2, uh, especially in a sequestration event, is water treatment, pH control. The CO2, when, when used properly, lowers the pH in water. Uh, we've talked about sequestration, we've talked about that a lot, 45Q, things like that. Uh, generally, when we're talking sequestration, we're saying, let's take the CO2 out of the atmosphere, put it into the ground. That's great, but at and, and, and the broad scale of it, the, the total volume of CO2, we don't have much choice. There's not enough uses of CO2. But, can we come up with other constructive uses for this CO2? And I think that's a lot of what we're going to see in markets and in the industry in, in the coming years and decades is technology and innovation around that. So right now we talk about uh, cement. Cement curing uh, is, is a widely known and widely uh, you know, ex excellent use of CO2 for sequestration. Um, and it's just good for the cement. But uh, you got that, you got grow houses and greenhouses, vertical farming, it increases crop yields, things like that. Another great use that sequesters that CO2. Well, a little known one is water treatment, mm -hmm. as we talked about. So that's what we're going to kind of delve into today is how is it used in water treatment? I'm not going to get too technical, but how do we use it? Why is it important? But more importantly, what does that mean now with the pending shortages and disruptions in supply? Is that going to impact your mind, his so you know, water? I don't know. Is it? Yeah. Let's talk about that. No, that, that's great. And, and little known, as Jeff mentioned, but widely used. This is something that has, has been... Uh, the CO2 use in, in the pH controlled water has been used for 50, 100 years and, and nobody knows about it. And CO2 is bad, right? We talk about how bad it is, but the reality is there are good applications of CO2 and water treatment being one of them. Add sequestration on top of that and you have an absolute win-win. Uh, so we're going to go and get a little bit technical on what the process looks like. Uh, you know, we've done a lot with water. Uh, Typically, that's with a municipality. So, you know, what's coming out of your tap, out of your faucet, uh, you know, we've probably had a play in that using the CO2. Uh, industrial partners, industrial uh, customers that we've worked with in the past, they're discharging to the rivers. They have permits from the EPA or the local authority. And I mean, that directly impacts communities downstream. And so to be able to leverage CO2 is critical. Why is that critical? Because we're getting rid of some real nasties. Yeah, absolutely. And very much, you know, I, I look at you said downstream and the downstream effects of not using CO2 in both cement curing and, and in, in water treatment. Think about these things, it's the upstream and the downstream. So, you know, talk about cement, which is the cement issue, but we'll definitely have a whole, whole uh, episode on cement curing. Mm -hmm. But in cement curing, you basically increase the tensile strength of, of uh, the cement, so you can use less raw materials. Well, think about that from a mining perspective and where all the chemicals and the raw materials that go into that cement come from, mining and all that, so that's all bad for the environment. We reduce that. Water treatment is the same thing, just a little different. In water treatment, when we use CO2, we actually eliminate the use of sulfuric acid. So mm -hmm. harmful, dangerous acids, both for the employee working with it from a pure OSHA safety standpoint. We got corrosion and pipes and things like that. But think about the manufacturing of sulfuric acid. That in and of itself is a is a bad for the environment event. It also produces a lot of CO2 during the process just because it's a manufacturing environment. So if we eliminate or reduce the reliance on these these nasties, like you said, 
uh, we're, and, and then we're doing a positive benefit game, the, the utilization and sequestration of that CO2 is a win-win-win. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're presented with a problem. What are we doing with all this CO2? We need to eliminate CO2, pull it from the atmosphere, we need to sequester it. Over here, we're using these, these horrible man-made chemicals for many, many processes. We can go ahead, take the CO2, sequester it, eliminate the use of these chemicals both at the, at the site location and also upstream in the manufacturing process where they're being produced and, and it does become a win-win. So what does this look like? Well, CO2 being natural has some really awesome characteristics that these nasty chemicals do not have. And, and I want to touch on those for a minute. So basically how the process works. You think it's technical. I'm going oh, to check out for a second. Yeah, set your alarms. Yeah, Two or three minutes from now you can wake back up. But uh, no, I'm like trying to do my Elon Musk. Give me the honorary PhD in chemical engineering. I don't have the degree. But if I can engage the audience for two minutes, maybe, you know. Did you just try to assimilate yourself with Elon Musk? God, I got big aspirations. You've got lazy <laughs> Oh, no. Hey, we're not making fun today. No, oh, I, I, yeah, hey, right. Continue. No, awesome. Explain this process. Too, so, so what's, what's happening basically is we're taking water and CO2, and under pressure, we're putting the CO2 into water. We get some mixing, uh, and we ensure that we don't see a pressure drop downstream, which would cause a release in the CO2. So because we're playing this pressure game with the CO2, we're basically forming uh, like a sparkling water, uh, a, a carbonic acid is what we call it. And the awesome thing about carbonic acid is since CO2 is naturally occurring, uh, it buffers around 5 pH. What does that mean? That means that your pH, no matter how much CO2 you put in the water, is never going to be able to get any lower than around 5. And to put that into perspective, a can of soda is about 3.5 pH. So when you think we're treating this water that's going into your drinking water, that's going downstream to your rivers, Knowing that you're only going to be at a pH as low as five when you're drinking Coke at three and a half is very comforting. When you add some of these sulfuric acids, caustic or uh, um, mineral acids that we talked about, you can undershoot to as low as one. And that's when the erosion of pipes happens. That's when the decay of the rivers happens. Any exceedance of permit, if you will, or, or any drop below what's allowed to be discharged creates huge problems to the environment. And we're avoiding those with the sequestration of CO2. Yeah, so you might be in compliance with your discharge permit from the EPA, but, but doing more damage downstream to our rivers and our, our brooks and our streams and things like that. When you use CO2, that goes down to the river and it actually has a positive net effect on, on the, the ecosystem downstream. Like fish and turtles come back to life and vegetation on the, on the banks of the rivers and things like that. I mean, that. think about it. Plants, plants consume that CO2. I mean, they, they, they consume CO2, they give off oxygen. And so, you know, we're, we're enriching these rivers. We're actually creating a net positive instead of potential, you know, dis yeah. decay and disruption. And so, you know, to kind of put the finest point on it, the finer point on it, uh, there are uh, thousands, absolutely thousands of, of installations at municipal drinking water facilities. If you live in a high pH state, not every state is all dependent on your groundwater where it's coming from, but a uh, uh, you know, majority of states in this country do have a higher pH groundwater. Virtually every one of them uses CO2. So let's, let's get transition now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's your education for the day. Science class is over. Mm, bummer. Okay, lab shortages. Now what? Uh, so now we're seeing that we've been talking about it. We know it. That's a fear, and here's the biggest fear that we have: uh, is is the concern about shortages in the market that we all know about is actually getting people in the in the, in the drinking water facilities to rethink CO two simply because of disruption. Um, and what would they, what would they rethink it to? Go back to sulfuric. So we're actually going backwards. Taking the step all this work to to you know capture the CO two sequester at forty five feet, everything like that. And we're going to send ourselves back to sulfuric acid. What, what should we do instead? Yeah, no, so an awesome solution is something called submerged combustion. And basically what we can do is, is I, I hit on earlier, we're playing on pressures. So at a depth, we're able to burn natural gas or propane as a fuel source. And the combustion under the water creates CO2. That CO2 gets absorbed by the water because of the pressure, and we're essentially creating on-demand CO2. And so this is great, and I, I kind of like to look at it two-folded. If you're a municipality where you don't have CO2 available from your own processes, if you don't have boilers, if you're not a high producer of CO2, but rather just a consumer and a needed consumer, right? Now you're concerned, I can't get my CO2 because of allocations, because of force majeure, and you can have this redundancy built in to have 
on-demand CO2 created in your water process. Yeah, it's not the most efficient relative to just you know buying CO2 or capturing CO2 and sending it. We're burning natural gas. We go natural gas prices, energy prices are much higher today than they were six months ago. Yeah. And that's probably not coming down soon. I, I, I equate it to a backup generator. You know, when you're, you live in a tornado zone or, or a hurricane zone, you, you have a generator for if the power goes out. That's what the submerged combustion system really could be. It's a, it's a backup supplemental system if there's a supply shortage as opposed to re-implementing an entire sulfuric acid system. Yeah. It's a great solution. Oh, and that's what we're all about on the podcast is we, we've hit on it many times. Efficiency and preparation. Right? We don't want to be reactive. We want to be proactive. So with the shortages pending, you have an option for backup. And I said this was twofold that I want to hit on the second fold. So one, you're the municipality and you rely on that CO2. But secondly, some of our industrial users that are looking to capture CO2 off their process, you know, they're, they're left with, well, we have CO2 for what we need, but what do we do with excess? Water treatment is a great solution. So many of these uh, users have their own water process where they are using these chemicals. You have on-demand CO2, not through the submerged combustion, but through your own production Absolutely. that you can simply repipe into your water process. So, um, you know, we talk about for those municipalities, what do you do with a shortage? And for your industrial users, what do you do with your excess? And and water treatment is absolutely the solution. It's widely known in, in municipal water, been going for decades now. I have a large volume users, but for the discharge with industrial permits and those guys, uh, less are known. And so uh, it's a great sequestration event and, and one that we, we think uh, we, we can expand upon in the market, great utilization of CO2. Yeah, no, so, it, it paints a beautiful picture and, and I, it's, it's certainly not about optics. It really is helping, but what an awesome story to be able to say, we're using our CO2, we're bringing down our footprint and putting that into the water that you, Mr. End User, are impacted by downstream through the lakes, through the rivers that we're discharging yeah. to. So we get really passionate about it. Save and the planet. There we go. Protect, protect, the, protect land the lands and, and the water. So let's close it out like this. Let's go full circle. Um, we, we said that uh, you might not have beer. Well, guess what? Beer is 95% water. So we beer at Catching Carving are ensuring the beer supply in this world. Oh, my gosh. And water. I love that. CO2. Dude, maybe we need to start doing beer reviews as well. I think that's what I'd like to this. Beer garden. <laughs> yeah. anyway. Guys, thank you all so much. We appreciate it. We'll see you here next time. And as always, reach out if you have questions. Like I said, this is a new topic and we want to be the educators. Like, comment, subscribe, follow us on all platforms. We'll see you for episode seven.